Thank you, Shasla. And thank you for all of you who have attended. I was hoping for a bigger audience. But, uh, so as Shasla has explained, I did my uh, postgraduate studies in coral reef valuation. And this is my work on, uh, for, which I did for my master's, which was an economic valuation of coral reefs. And uh, uh, my study focused on uh, val valuing a marine protected area. So the main goal of the research was to see if the potential benefits that we can get from effective management uh, can we, that it justifies the funding. So basically, uh, would we get enough benefits? So if you invest in proper management, I wanted to show that you can uh, get benefits by improving management and investing in management. So uh, and. And the motivation for this research actually, as Shazla has said, I've been working in the, um, in the environment sector for a long time. And uh, I worked in the environment ministry and I used, had to work a lot with environmental management issues. And my interest went to reef evaluation and as uh, one of the main reasons for this is that we, we are surrounded by coral reefs. Our islands are made out of coral, from coral reefs, and uh, they protect us and our livelihood. So uh, we are basically very dependent on our coral reefs, and there, there isn't many um, uh, research or available on the value of coral reefs in the Maldives. So this was a motivation. Plus, in my... Uh, it, uh, my experiences working with the environment in the environment ministry, I've seen that we there is quite a lot of degradation of coral reefs. Uh, we have maybe this shows uh, uh, in a resort the water bungalows, but uh, I'm not saying necessarily development is bad, but we, we do a lot of development activities without actually considering. Uh, the impacts on the reefs. So uh, seeing these kind of things, and I began to wonder why there, is, uh, there isn't the drive from the policy makers to actually invest in uh, better management of our coral reefs. For example, we have, uh, at that time, th this work was actually done in between 2006 to 2007, and the work completed in 2008. Uh, so during that time, there were 25 marine protected areas. So we were doing everything right on paper. But on the ground, while working with uh, the actual environment, we, we see these things are on paper, but they are not. Uh, there's no management plan. So it's effectively as if uh, there is no protected areas at all. So. Uh, for this reason, I got interested to do this work. And now I'll go to the, the work itself. So my main objective was to estimate the willingness to pay of tourists visiting Bai Atoll. I have chosen Bai Atoll as a study area because at the time there was the Atoll Ecosystem Conservation Project, which resulted in the uh, Biosphere Reserve in Maldives in Baitol. So this was the, uh, and I was hoping my work will be useful to the project and the process is itself. And so, if there was improved management and proper enforcement, would tourists be willing to pay for, uh, pay say a conservation fee or, or a user fee to come to Baitol? So this was the aim uh, of the main objective of my research. And to do that, I undertook a series of tasks. The first, so I reviewed the existing management. How is it currently? And at the same time, I also did consultations with uh, the local communities, the dive schools, and even getting information from the government itself. And all this information I used to develop an improved management scenario. So from the current status quo, how can things be improved? 
And this scenario I used in my willingness to pay survey where I was uh, showing the tourists, this is how I plan to manage the uh, area. So given this, would you be willing to pay a fee to come to this uh, at all? And so uh, this both the improved management scenario, I found out what would be the cost of implementing this. So this leads to my costs and the benefits is coming from how much each visitor is willing to pay. So from that I did the cost benefit analysis in order to show that there is potential benefit from actually uh, implementing proper management. So just maybe uh, you're all familiar, I don't have, but just to show where I did my study, that's by at all, just a closer look. Uh, that's where the gully high is and is the picture clear? So nice. But uh, the gully high has been declared a protected area since October 1999 and it, it was uh, only recreational diving and traditional bait fisheries allowed in the the, the Galiha and uh, it was decided to, uh, as a protected area mainly from recommendation from dive schools and the tourism sector because of the rich marine life in the area. And some of the, uh, the according to the dive schools, you can frequently see gray reef sharks, white tipped reef sharks, barracudas, and so many, it, it, it's quite a rich marine area. And I have put, at that time there were five resorts, but I was able to access only four of the resorts uh, where they actually allowed to, me to go and conduct the survey. And I visited four uh, local communities as well and uh, to get an idea of how management can be improved. So just So I'll uh, just present a little bit about what I found about the initial review of the management at Tigaliha. And from talking, now my SS, there is very limited uh, actual documented uh, documentations on this. So I consulted the dive schools, the government to find out what uh, the situation is like. And I found that it's just like any other marine protected area in the Maldives. There is no management plan. Uh, it's only on paper that it's a marine protected area. So the, based on this, I used an evaluation of the management and effectiveness of marine protected areas done by Zuhair. Uh, and uh, he, so this has been done, uh, work that has been already done. So I used that to uh, um, say as um, Digaliha was managed as any other, so this will this shows typically how Digaliha is managed. So as I said before, there's no management plans, there's no management objectives, and there was no community and stakeholder participation during the establishment process either. And there are no resources allocated to actually manage the area. So this is very important. There's no, and that's something even while working in the government side and even now during, uh, I do attend some consultations and stakeholder groups and this is something that frequently comes up, the lack of funding. May, may, not, not just the human resources, but funding itself is the main issue. And my purpose for this was if, we could generate uh, revenues from a fee, then that can be used for uh, management. So you don't have to wait for the funds to fall into your lap. So you can be proactive. So that was my main thinking when doing this research, to show you can find the funds. We just have to start working on it. And uh, there are multi-agencies with responsibilities, and so there's lots of overlap of mandates. So lack of uh, so uh, there isn't very good coordination and on top of it there is no research and monitoring done. So although you have a marine protected area 
very basic thing is the, there has to be monitoring of the health of the reef to see if there is any improvement. If, the, if this is not being done, then basically you cannot actually uh, say how effective the establishment of the marine protected area is.